Now, our next speaker is Sarah Sparham, who's one of the infectious disease registrars at the Austin. And uh, we, this very issue about, you know, the attitudes about medical staff and their non-compliance and uh, where was the issue? Was it bad leadership or was it at the level of the resident or was it something else? And so we uh, funded Sarah uh, in a break in her training for a bit to just follow a whole lot of medical staff around on their ward rounds and see what the behaviour was like on the ward round. So that's what Sarah's going to present to us and you'll be surprised by the findings. Thanks, Sarah. Doctors do lag behind all the other groups historically and still today. And at the Austin, in our first audit um, period this year, the medical staff overall had a compliance rate of 71% compared with whole hospital of 82%. And there's a lot of reasons this may be. In some cases, it may be genuine lack of knowledge about the five moments. Some feel they're too busy, they're distracted, they're, it doesn't really matter for them, they don't, they're not actually touching the patients, they don't realise what they're doing at the time. And unfortunately, there's, there is still a little bit of scepticism around regarding the importance of, of hand hygiene. So ward rounds are a sort of a special case in the hospital in that they go from bed to bed, from ward to ward, in and out of isolation rooms. And really, they're, if um, hand hygiene isn't vigilant, they're a perfect vehicle for moving infection around the hospital but they're not really captured particularly well by standard auditing methods because they tend to be location-based. So you go and audit on a particular ward on a particular day. Doctors might move through and you'll pick them up opportunistically and that's that, um, which doesn't allow us to sort of examine the particular behaviour on ward rounds and also means we can't gather data on specific units very efficiently um, unless they're based on one specific ward, which in some cases happens. Doctors tend to move ward to ward and so you sort of only pick up some of their behaviour. Wardrons also have a lot of different variables which can com affect compliance, um, apart from just the individuals. There, there's time pressure, so particularly some surgical ward rounds see a lot of patients in a short period of time, and I'll give some data on that in a moment. And um, also there's different sort of hierarchy and different staff on the ward round, so you can have anything from a couple of registrars, a registrar and intern to a ward round of sort of 15 people with several consultants, allied health, different levels of junior doctors. And different ward rounds also see different patient populations. So medical staff may not have to un undo any dressings on a ward round, whereas a busy surgical ward round may take down multiple dressings, which obviously changes the sort of moments. So we decided to look into this specifically, and our question of our study was to investigate whether there are particular medical units, training levels, i.e. consultant, registrar, resident, intern, or in fact individual practitioners with poor compliance, by auditing on ward rounds, and then subsequently we, um, on the basis of this data we've collected, um, intend to design, design intervention, but at the moment we're just at this first part of the study. So we measure <coughs> compliance based on the five moments I set out by the World Health Organisation to try to establish what barriers there were to the good, to good compliance by medical staff and then um, find some opportunities to intervene. This was a prospective audit and we selected units um, with high patient load. We couldn't follow all ward rounds obviously because a lot of them happen at the same time. So we selected ones with high patient load, so general surgical rounds, general medical rounds, units with high risk patients, so immunocompromised <coughs> patients such as haematology, oncology and liver transplant unit renal who have transplant patients, and also units who had high risk practices, so units with a lot of dressings on the round, such as plastics and vascular. It was a single auditor, that was me, so I underwent the um, hand hygiene accreditation um, at the Austin. And um, I think it, was, I mean, it was in a sort of unique position to be able to do this. I've been at the Austin for quite a long time. The un different units are used to seeing me around on the wards. Um, and there was sort of a bit of a sweetener in terms of their acceptance of me on the ward round and that they could ask me for advice on antibiotics and so forth. <laughs> so they were generally pretty happy to have, to have me around from that point of view, which I think helped a little bit. Now, all of the units, as in the heads of units, were made aware of the audit beforehand. And the majority of the time, the staff from the rounds were informed. And there were a couple of cases where I tagged along to a, a ward round which was sort of sweeping along and nobody really noticed I was there. Um, but for the, for the most part, they were aware I was there, they knew what I was doing. So just keep that in mind when you see the rates of compliance that come up. So this is the form that I used, um, just to show you. We just essentially um, adjusted the normal form so that there was more space to record other data, such as um, the individual, which unit it was, and any other factors at that particular moment, so whether it was an isolation room, that sort of thing. In this case, there wasn't any hand hygiene um, because the hand hygiene <coughs> was affected by there being no alcoholic 
hand rope because it was a bariatric bed which has no capacity to put that on. But actually, for the most part, availability of hand rub was not an issue in this audit. So I collected 650 moments um, of 15 units I spread across medical, surgical and subacute, and I'll, I'll show you the spread in a moment. I said most teams were pretty receptive and engaged, so I experienced very little um, resistance. Um, some of the surgical units kind of ignored me. A lot of the medical units were really happy to have me and were asking for feedback. So I didn't provide at the time feedback, but if I was asked to provide feedback at the end of the round, then I did so. Um, but it was, it, was, you know, it was fairly well received as an, as an exercise. And this is the spread of the audits. So in the sort of orangey, yellow, red colours, those are the medical teams, um, and the blue are the surgical. So those two teams are about even and made up the vast majority of, so those two departments made up the vast majority of the moments contributed. Liver transplant's a bit of a special case in that the ward ran has both physicians and surgeons, um, and then subacute and green contributing a, a smaller proportion. So these are the percentage of moments overall. So not unexpectedly, most were moments one, moment four. Um, with two and three um, being a much smaller proportion of the moments. And this is compliance by moment, which is concerning. So moment two is probably one of the more important moments in that you're, you're about to access a clean site and then moment three after <coughs> potentially accessing a contaminated site. Now I will say that with moment two, about half of those misses, they were wearing a clean pair of gloves. They just hadn't alcohol rubbed appropriately in one way or another. So it's not a complete disaster, but it's not compliant with the, with the five moments. And this is the percentage of moments con um, contributed by each position of the people. So we've got the heads of units in the dark red, the consultants in the bright red, fellows which were pretty negligible, and then the vast majority was um, registrars. As you can see, the HMOs and the interns actually contributed very few moments, and those were, they were often moment five, so they'd gone in, touched a drug chart or something and, and walked out they very, very rarely actually laid hands on the patient, which is an issue in terms of their education. But from our point of view, um, it's an interesting point because that's often where education is targeted in the hospital. So when the interns come in during um, orientation, or you know, they, they all have weekly, weekly education, and they're told about something, but they're, they're not actually contributing to most of the problem because they're not really touching <coughs> the patients. Whereas the registrars, obviously, are, are the ones who are, who are doing this the most. And by the time you know, they've gone through orientation at the start of the year about five times, they're not really listening anymore. And then their education through the year is much more focused on, on their particular specialty, not the sort of thing like hand hygiene. This is compliance by position. So the fellows, which are the poor performing one there, you can sort of discount because they, they were very few moments. You can see the rest of them were actually pretty even. So I think there's been a bit of thought that the more senior people on, in, in terms of medical <coughs> staff don't necessarily perform as well. And, that, and I know that there have been you know, studies in the past which shows if a senior member of the ward round performs poorly, then the rest of the team tend to, tend to do so as well. But we found that actually the, the heads of department consultants were doing pretty well at the Austin. And if that would have been actually a little high if it wasn't for one particular member of staff who pulled that down a little. His name we could give you for a certain price. Yes. <laughs> Yes, I could see me after. Um, was the registrars who are who are really performing most of the moments so are coming in at 61%, so well below the benchmark that we're aiming for. HMOs and interns not doing too badly, but again, not really contributing most of the moments. And this is the compliance by the different units. <coughs> so if you look at the medical units, they're performing pretty well. A lot of them are actually above above benchmark. Infectious diseases performed well, I'm, I'm pleased to say. <laughs> um, and for one week, a, a certain consultant in the room was on the round, so he did help with that. Um, renal didn't perform as well, and that I think was a combination of the fact they've got a lot of patients in isolation rooms, a lot of people with VRE, but also, um, also certain members of staff were pulling that down as well. The surgeons overall did perform more poorly than the physician units. Um, General surgeons, not as badly. They were often registrar-led ward rounds with smaller numbers of staff. Um, whereas the specialty units, were the, so orthopaedics, plastics and vascular, really were not performed particularly well. And they did have a lot of patients with dressings. They ha often had very large um, ward rounds, up you know, 8, 10, 12 staff on the ward rounds, which makes it physically difficult potentially to get to the hand rub. Um, and often very sort of rapid ward rounds, getting around a lot of patients in a short amount of time. 
Subacute were doing, were doing pretty well. You'd hope in a way that they would because they spend a lot of time with each patient. They're not under much time pressure. There's, um, they've got time to, to perform the hand hygiene. And then overall, uh, at the end, we've got the combined rates, which was 64%, which was um, not quite as good as, as what the medical staff come out overall in uh, previous audit, but fairly consistent with you know, previous figures in previous years. So if we sort of put the departments together, you can see that, the, as, I, as I mentioned, the surgeons definitely do come in well under the medical and subacute units who individually are sort of getting pretty close to the benchmark rate. So we did collect some of this other data which we thought might be affecting behaviour. So the average number of staff overall on a round was five. On medical round, that tend to be three. Often a registrar, a student, an intern or a consultant, a registrar and a resident. Surgical round, the average was eight and it was often above that, and that's a whole range of people, not all medical. Average patients seen on a ward round was nine, and the average duration was 79 minutes. <coughs> medical ward rounds substantially longer, with about 12 minutes per patient, with surgical rounds shorter but more patients, so average of five minutes per patient. And the shortest per patient um, time was orthopaedics who spent a <laughs> massive two minutes per patient on their round. <coughs> often with very few moments because they didn't actually touch the patient. And one particularly interesting thing we found, um, not hand hygiene as such, but an interesting infection control um, thing. This was the lantern, which was taken by the plastic round um, around the spinal unit. And it was taken so that they could um, examine deep the deep wounds better. So this was placed in the bed so they could see and then lifted up and placed in the next bed, not cleaned in between. So. This is one thing that we, um, we did deal with directly um, <laughs> as part of this, and that's not being used there. They've so gone back to their handheld torch. Hygiene Australia. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's the green lantern. So. so while I was sort of entering all the data and doing the preliminary analysis, two things seemed to come out um, that were associated with missed moments, and that's <coughs> improper performance of hand hygiene around glove use, and touching the curtains, whether people were either not aware of that they'd touched a curtain or not aware that they had to debug after touching a curtain. So we sort of drilled down a bit deep to see if this was real. And when we excluded all moments where gloves were worn, which you know, was fairly, fairly stupid because that's recorded on the tool, compliance was overall 71%, so it was higher. And compliance when gloves were worn, 47%. So it's a significant difference. And previous studies have found that glove use is, is a risk factor for poor compliance. And there are some practical issues with that, as in if you just alcohol rubs, then the gloves tend to stick, you have to wait for it to dry, which it should be anyway. Um, and also isolation rooms, it's difficult if you put your gloves on outside and then you have to open the door and then people don't necessarily then change their gloves, that sort of thing. And just a lack of awareness around having to debug before and after. And so when I was presenting this to our department, there were some of the people saying, well, it is, it's, it is a bit impractical in a quick ward round. Like it does take up time to change your gloves and um, when you've got debug it, sticking and so forth. But it can be overcome. There was one particular registrar on one ward round who was not debugging, he was just changing his gloves. And so he had a compliance rate of something like 10%. And his resident was, was not very happy with the way their team was performing and was a bit ashamed. He's, and she said, you've got to debug before and after glove use. And, oh, okay. And he did. Um, it didn't disrupt the ward round, didn't take any longer, and his compliance went up to 90%. So it is possible. It's not, it's not something that is an insurmountable practical issue. And the other thing was the curtains. Now, I couldn't analyse in the same way as the gloves because I didn't record when curtains were involved with the correct moment. But the percentage of misses where it was because someone had touched a curtain was 20%, so one in five. And if you ex go back to that sort of subset where of moments without glove use, then it was an even higher percentage of those, those moments. Practically, there, there has to be beds, um, alcohol rub at the, hand si at the bedside in order to debug after touching curtain. But as I said, within this audit, that wasn't the issue. There, about 98% sort of, of the time, there was alcohol rub. Really, it was lack of awareness. Sometimes, just they hadn't noticed that they'd touched a curtain. But for the most part, people didn't realise the curtains were cont contaminated. And really, they get changed potentially once a year. Like they're, they're pretty grotty. So if you combine <coughs> those two things, the percentage of misses involving gloves and or curtains was 57%. So more than half of the misses just came down to those two things. 
I think the important thing with that is there's a lot of barriers to compliance with doctors. We've spoken about the hierarchical things and being busy and lots of things, but this is really awareness and so it's amenable to education and pretty simple education. You just have to tell them you need to debug before and after gloves and after, before and after touching curtains. It's not a complicated message. And we also, I think, found that this sort of targeted audit rather than just a location-based audit was able to um, elicit unexpected factors in poor compliance that we wouldn't have found otherwise. So to summarise in our audit, poor compliance was associated with moments two and three, obviously a concern, and a lot of that was to do with glove use, with surgical units, with wearing gloves during a moment, and touching curtains. And as I've just mentioned, we, we were able to identify these new targets for intervention, and if we were able to eliminate all the missed moments involved in gloves and curtains, that would have actually brought the doctors overall to above the benchmark of 80%. So it doesn't necessarily have to be as complicated as we think. So as I, said, I wasn't specifically giving feedback in because we were wanting to get a baseline rate without, without that. But when it was asked, I gave it, and some of the surgical teams were asking, more often the, the more junior stuff, but there were some of the younger consultants who were interested and were very keen and wanting to know what their rates were and what they could do. So I suppose uh, when Sarah and I were looking through these data, one of the things which was surprising to me was the pretty high rates amongst the heads of units. Mm. Um, Sarah, do you just want to comment? Were there any heads of units who weren't aware of the importance of alcohol hand rub? Or, I mean, obviously their rates look good, but was there any negativity from them? Or, or lack of executive leadership, I suppose? For the majority of the units, no. The, um, the heads of the units seemed aware and they were leading by example pretty well. Some of them were a bit old school and were washing their hands rather than rubbing, but that's fine. Um, there were a couple of units, one in one surgical unit in particular, where the um, the, the head of the unit was particularly disinterested and somewhat sceptical, and that I think is reflected in the overall unit's compliance. I just did so, an ethnography study at a teaching university in the United States, and it seemed to be a tendency for uh, physicians who, uh, a lead physician took ownership of that patient, and there was low compliance among the specialty surgeons or the specialty physicians <coughs> didn't, and, and so my perception was that perhaps it had to do with an ownership of that patient's, uh, and, uh, you know, and an identification of this is my patient, I will be more compliant, mm. this is so somebody else's patient, I'm just here to do a procedure, I see, well, I I mean, we didn't look at that specifically, but I think that probably fits. Certainly, yeah, the physicians and, and the more junior staff who were involved day to day with that patient did seem to sort of anecdotally have better compliance, whereas the visiting consultants who were just doing, you know, on the ward round, the grand round, had no, nothing particular to do with that patient, didn't perform that well. So, yeah, you may be right. Sarah knows there was one particular very senior physician who was shocking. I think it was 20%. And in that case, I, I think this is the point about, say, the Vanderbilt model or the others, where if we had gone out and kind of spoken to all the heads of units, a lot of them would have been cheesed off with me because actually they're pretty good. What, it re what I need to do is speak to that one individual and show him his results compared to all the other medical heads of units that he is like five standard deviations away from mm. everyone else. And I think that you know ta this sort of thing allows that very accurate targeting with data. I mean, in terms of auditing number of people, they were, consultants were altogether two thirds of the moment, so we were certainly auditing them. But yeah, yeah this, this one was, was a standout. And he, as I say, he, it was bad enough that he dragged the whole bar down yeah. for that group. I, bl I blanked it out, obviously. But, so um, we know yes. every single doctor, so actually we could send them in by name. You know, Lindsay Grace, and your hand hygiene rate was. Yep. So we have their individual rate. Right? And if you um, have thought about looking at the influence of gender. That's a good question because we have a lot of yeah. female surgeons, actually. I don't know. Yeah, yeah, we do. Um, <laughs> we do. Yeah, no, I mean, we certainly have that information and we have the year of graduation, the age, all the sort of stuff you can get from, from medical workforce. So we could, could analyse for all of that, um, but we, we haven't. Just thinking back, I think. We do have a reasonable balance, I think, certainly in the physicians of, of males and females, and yeah, it's male skewed in the surgeons, but um, yeah, the, I mean, the poorly performing position was a, was a man. Um, yeah, our previous ordering was essentially location-based, ward-based, so for some medical units you could kind of extrapolate, so some are very based on their home ward, but a lot are not, and so no. 
Is it to fo literally to follow them around is the <coughs> only way to do it? I mean, I think the, the interesting thing about this different auditing technique is it kind of fits in with how doctors think. I work for a certain unit. What is my unit's rate? Mm. But the way we audit where someone stands in a room, in a ward, unless it happens to be the surgical ward, you can't give unit-based rates. And so everyone's kind of mixed in together. Yeah. I didn't really encounter any resistance, a little bit of people ignoring me, but they were pretty happy to have me. And um, the other thing, just going back to the last point as well, is um, as well as wanting to know their own rates, they were wanting to know other teams' rates and, and how they sat. <laughs> so certainly appealing to the competitive nature of some of the units, um, I think, is, is very useful. Thank you, Sarah.